Hello, everyone. Thank you for those of you that are just joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started in about a minute or so. So just hang tight and we'll get started shortly. Thank you for those that are just joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started in just a couple of minutes. We're just waiting for the room to fill in. I'll keep repeating this message a couple of times, but we should get started in about a minute. Thank you. Hello to those of you just joining us. We're going to get started in about a minute. We're just waiting for the room to fill in. Repeat this message about one more time and then we'll get started. Okay, cool. We are going to get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining our Intro to Tech Equity webinar. Hope you all can hear and see me. Uh, my name is Herman Calderon. I'm the Community Manager at Tech Equity Collaborative. And in my role, I get to engage with our supporters through our events, and I get to engage with you all uh, here. So feel free to drop in any questions into the Q&A box as we go. Uh, but we won't be answering any of those questions until the end of the presentation. And we will also be sending out an email with uh, links to some of the things that we'll be talking about today, as well as a link to the presentation slides and the recording. Um, a little bit about what we'll be talking about today. We'll cover why Tech Equity exists as an organization and how we got started. We'll talk about the key issues we've identified to help us understand the problems that need to be solved and how we can take action to address our most pressing economic issues. So first, let's start with why are we here? Well, Tech Equity got started because some of its founders and early members saw the symptoms of growing inequity within their neighborhoods and that they understood that there was this perception that tech and tech workers were the cause of the problem. So they noticed things such as rising rents, increases in displacement, increases in traffic, and people experiencing homelessness. And as they talked to others, they realized that they weren't alone in their concerns and that they as tech workers were uniquely positioned to help contribute to some of these solutions. And especially now in the face of the pandemic, we're seeing that the affordability crisis gets so much worse with an increased burden placed on lower income people and communities of color. And many of our neighbors are uncertain as to how they'll continue to manage what was already an untenable situation. And at the same time, tech workers have remained relatively unscathed. So the pandemic has a potential to even further exacerbate some of this inequality that our region has already historically uh, been going through. And because of this affordability crisis, uh, communities are frustrated and it really comes to no surprise. I know for myself, I've grown up in the Bay Area my whole life and I've been able to see both sides of the coin. I have friends and family who are worried about the changes they see in their communities, what that means for their jobs, what that means for their homes and their families. Um, but I also have friends and family who have pursued jobs within the tech industry and they're finding lots of success. However, we see that when tech shoulders the blame, it starts to create this us versus them dynamic that's further dividing our communities. And we know that tech workers care and that they want to help and that they don't want to contribute to this uh, deepening divide within our region. While we're all unsure as to how long we'll be managing this new normal that's caused by the pandemic, it's important to note that many within the tech sector have remained relatively unscathed. And more than most other sectors, tech has been able to make the transition to working from home with little to no disruption. And now more than ever, tech workers and tech companies have an opportunity to support more equitable solutions in our communities. And we have an opportunity to use our positions of privilege uh, to support our neighbors and but it can be hard to know how to best engage especially in times of such uncertainty and this is the state of our housing crisis uh in the bay area i think the fact that rents are rising really aren't a surprise or isn't a surprise to anyone on this call because we all know this we feel this 
or we've heard this from friends and family already. And while some Californians are very successful in the tech-driven economy here, the average salaries for tenants have actually decreased slightly throughout the years. And we're showing stats for California because that's where we're based as an organization, and it's where tech is headquartered, but a similar version of this is playing out all across the country. And it really is a sharp contrast with the narrative of tech success and without tech at the table to work together to address our shared crisis, it's understandable as to why communities are frustrated, uh, like we just talked about. And just to put it in context with the pandemic, before the pandemic, unemployment was hovering just around 4% and people were already struggling to make ends meet. And when the virus hit, uh, unemployment claims had spiked to 16%, which was a more dramatic spike than our last recession. So in the span of a month uh, last year, we lost a decade's worth of, of recovery. And as instability and uncertainty continues, we'll see more of our neighbors being pushed into homelessness or worse. At Tech Equity, we're as optimistic as ever about the tech industry's potential to drive broad-based growth that's accessible to everyone, but it's clear that it's not going to happen on its own. We have to invest in the people and the institutions that are serving our communities, and we have to show up, and we have to do so in partnership with those in the community that are feeling the most pain if we're to dismantle this notion that tech is the enemy. At Tech Equity, we believe that a more engaged tech sector is a more ethical tech sector, that connecting tech workers and companies to the issues where they live in will result in more ethical decisions at work and more engagement in our communities. And we know we can do this, and the first step is to show up. And you all have done a great first step by signing on to this webinar today and joining in on the discussion. Our goal at Tech Equity is to change the conditions in which the tech sector is growing. We believe that effective structural change will eliminate a culture and policies that have institutionalized inequity, leading to stronger and more resilient communities. And we help tech workers approach these big problems and engage in system change in three major ways. So our programs educate you about the most critical civic issues where you live. And we do this in a variety of ways, but some of our programming includes book club discussions, panel discussions, uh, webinars such as these and voter guides that we produce around election season. And we advocate for public policy that rebalances the power and builds economic equity in the process. So a perfect example of this is the Tenant Protection Act of 2019, which we worked alongside community members, uh, legislators, uh, and community organizations to help extend protections uh, to 8 million California renters, preventing unjust evictions and price gouging of rents. And finally, there's corporate practice aiming to turn companies into agents of equity in the broader community through our corporate partnerships and engagements with companies. And tech workers have this outsized political power that has largely been untapped to when it comes to public policy advocacy. So connecting tech workers to outside perspectives, it builds more empathy and ethical uh, practices in our workplaces, in our products, and in our surrounding communities. At Tech Equity, our two key issue areas are housing and workforce and labor. And while housing costs are a core part of this, the issues really are intertwined because where you live affects your access to opportunity and what job you have affects where you're able to afford to live. And our goal is bold, comprehensive change by companies and government that's led by the tech workforce. And these issues have only gotten more urgent in the face of the pandemic, but we're all well positioned to adapt our agenda to these new realities. And while the pandemic has exposed the cracks of our economy, these underlying issues have already existed in our economy for decades. So let's learn a little bit more about inequity within our own neighborhoods. This affordability crisis is decades in the making, and the policy choices we've made over the course of decades have set us up for this level of pain that our community is feeling now during the pandemic. So in the 1930s, the federal government instituted a policy <clears throat> that's still felt today, especially by communities of color in the Bay Area, in, <clears throat> sorry, in California and across the country. And that policy is redlining. So <clears throat> redlining was a process in which the Homeowners Loan Corporation, a federal agency, gave neighborhoods ratings to guide investment. And this policy is named for the red or hazardous neighborhoods that were deemed riskiest. So on those maps, those neighborhoods were literally redlined, and those communities that were deemed risky for investment <clears throat> didn't receive any investment. And these neighborhoods were predominantly home to communities of color, and that really is by no accident. 
the hazardous ratings were in large part based on racial demographics. So in other words, redlining was a discriminatory and a racist policy, and it made it hard for residents to get loans for home ownership or maintenance of their homes for something like building a new roof. And consequently, redlining led to cycles of disinvestment, including development and production within these neighborhoods. And there's a terrible history of underinvestment, underbuilding, and exclusion in our country. And often those communities that have been historically underinvested and have been redlined are the very same communities that are at risk of gentrification today. And the map we're seeing on the screen is a map of San Francisco of a redlined neighborhood. Uh, so everything in red blocks that you're seeing are uh, historically redlined neighborhoods. The crisis we're living in is decades in the making, uh, way before tech, and it's not unique to the Bay Area. It extends across California and across the country. So these are examples of red line neighborhoods in Austin and Atlanta. Austin's the map on the left side, Atlanta's the map on the right side, and both these cities are up and coming tech hubs uh, in the country who have also experienced historical red line neighborhoods. So by preventing entire neighborhoods from accessing this capital, these neighborhoods were unable to build the schools that they needed, small businesses, and a community that fostered economic success and opportunity. And it caused many of the people who lived in red line neighborhoods for generations to fall in and stay in liquid asset poverty. Now, you may be asking yourselves, what is liquid asset poverty? Well, someone is considered to be in liquid asset poverty if they don't have uh, enough savings to cover their basic expenses for three months after experiencing an income shock. And an income shock can be a huge rent increase, uh, you suddenly lose your job, or you have uh, to fix your car and it's super expensive. And it impacts almost one out of three Californians. 33.9% of Californians are in liquid asset poverty and people of color and low, in low income people are affected at much higher rates with 41%, 41.2% of African-American households living in liquid asset poverty and 56.2% of Latino households living in liquid asset poverty. And there really isn't a single reason as to why this is happening. Uh, many years of policy decisions have led to these outcomes, which are especially burdensome for communities of color. And these policies have often predated tech's arrival, like we just said. Uh, but tech workers cannot take a better role in supporting better policies moving forward. And the twin forces of a housing shortage, particularly with affordable housing and wages that don't cover the cost of living, have created this regional crisis that has hindered opportunity growth and prosperity for families and businesses alike. And as you can imagine, these statistics will likely be impacted by the outcomes of the pandemic. Many people in our communities were already struggling. And as pandemic recovery continues to be starkly uneven and unequal, many of our neighbors are facing increased instability and likely will for years to come if we don't implement the necessary solutions. As we can see, the hourly pay for workers has also not increased much the last couple of decades, even though productivity has dramatically increased. And according to the Economic Policy Institute, the share of workers covered by a collective bargaining agreement, aka unions, dropped from 27% to 11.6% between 1979 and 2019, meaning that the union coverage rate is now less than half where it was 40 years ago. And this means that employees have less bargaining power to advocate for pay rates in alignment with the work that they're delivering. And while all workers have lost out because of this, Black, Indigenous, and people of color are the most impacted. And while there's a gap between worker pay and productivity, like we just talked about, there's also a pay gap between uh, race. So white men are earning more cents to the dollar. It's that orange bar on the left in comparison to Black men and women, the blue bars on the right. And because Black, Indigenous, and people of color are getting paid less and disproportionately, they're not able to afford living in the cities that are providing these good jobs. So the cost of living here was already high. So let's take a look at what a worker earning minimum wage fares in the current rental market. So this is what it takes to afford an average two-bedroom apartment in San Francisco. If you're making $133,000 a year, you can afford the average two-bedroom working a regular uh, eight hour day. However, if you're making minimum wage in San Francisco, you need to work 40 hours a day to afford that two bedroom. Again, if you're making minimum wage, you'd need to work 40 hours a day to afford that two bedroom. And there's only 24 hours in a day. So we're actually setting up an impossible situation for low wage workers to afford 
being able to live in the city. And this problem persists across the country. Even though costs in up and coming tech cities like Austin and Denver and Atlanta aren't as high as San Francisco and California, the cost of living is still unreasonable for anyone earning minimum wage in those regions. And in San Francisco, it's not just people outside the tech sector that are struggling to afford the city. There's this common misconception that uh, all tech workers are paid these lavish salaries. However, not every salaried employee is making six figures. Some salaried tech employees like those in customer success or marketing are paid salaries that are considered to be uh, low income in the Bay Area. And even further away from this image of the wealthy tech worker are the thousands of contractors and contingent workers like security guards, custodians, and cooks who are working long hours to maintain tech companies but receive minimum benefits and are not paid as much. So you have to have a good salary to afford your apartment, but why is your apartment so expensive to begin with? Well, rents are going up due in part to lack of supply, and this chart is showing us what we should be building. The state sets goals for how much housing local communities should build in order to keep up with demand and population growth. And these are called RHNA goals, R-H-N-A, and that stands for Regional Housing Needs Allocation. And as you can see, we're doing a pretty good job at meeting our RENA goal for the above moderate income housing. Uh, that's that big blue bar on the right side of your screen. And that's affordable. People are making that good salary like we just talked about. But we're not building anywhere close enough housing for lower and moderate income people. Those are the two red bars on the left side of your screen. And as housing costs have skyrocketed with production of affordable housing not being matched, working class residents and communities of color have been driven out of our urban core and pushed into the outer edges of our region, further away from job centers, and some residents have been displaced from the region altogether. And remember when someone tells you that we just need to build more housing, it's important that we ask them, build more housing for whom? Again, we're not building enough housing at lower levels of affordability. And because we're not building enough housing that's affordable for lower and middle income people, they're leaving our communities at higher rates while people with higher incomes are coming in and staying in. So this chart is showing us how people in lower incomes, those are the orange bars, have left San Francisco at higher rates while people with higher incomes have increased migration into the city. And people beneath 30% AMI are in a more drastic situation where they can't even afford to leave San Francisco as they're being pushed into homelessness or worse. So that's why that last blue bar is actually increasing. There just isn't enough affordable housing available to help support the most vulnerable members in the community. And amongst people of color, the rates of uh, displacement continue to be tragic. As we talked uh, about earlier, Black, Black and Latino populations are living in liquid asset poverty at higher rates and have been leaving San Francisco at higher rates over the past couple of years. So a combination of discriminatory housing laws, low wages, and a lack of affordable housing have created this crisis of displacement. And displacement really is driven by policy choices. And we may see this ratio of displacement continue to rise as the pandemic continues to progress. And like we said, the folks that are the most rent burdened are in low-wage jobs, and low-wage jobs are getting hit the hardest by this crisis. And we can't build our way out to solve our problems, but it is true that we don't have enough homes for people. The good news is that uh, members at Tech Equity are showing up for the community, and tech workers are members of the community and should be at the table working together alongside non-tech community members. And together we can advocate for solutions to our most pressing shared problems. And we have to work together to address these underlying issues that are driving inequity within our tech economy. So the good news is that we can make a different set of choices uh, moving forward. You know, at Tech Equity, we envision a world where a growing tech-driven economy creates opportunity for everyone and where tech sector employees and companies are engaged and active participants in making our communities better places to live. And we've identified structural changes that need to happen in order to achieve this vision, but we won't be able to achieve this without the necessary policy changes. So here's what we've identified in the housing world. We need to take an above all approach to tackling our housing affordability crisis, and that starts with production building more housing specifically at lower levels of affordability. And we can do this through zoning and permitting reform that brings down the cost of constructing housing by removing delays 
and lengthy administrative processes that make it too expensive to build. Preservation, making sure we're providing more resources to subsidize and maintain and improve existing affordable housing. Protection, we need to protect existing tenants from displacement. So it's gonna take a long time to build the housing that we need. So in the meantime, we need to make sure that existing tenants and renters are protected from displacement. Racial equity, racism is embedded in our economic, political, and social systems. It's embedded in us all and especially in housing. So that means that we have to be explicit about how racism and racial bias are upheld in housing. So we have to craft policy solutions that are building equity in response. And especially now we need to be thinking about short and long-term solutions to preservation and protection. Because like we've talked about, many of our neighbors are more at risk than ever as a result of the last couple of years. And we also need to make sure that we all get enough compensation and benefits to live a healthy and stable life. So we want to ensure that companies are doing their part to contribute to the communities they exist within, that people in the surrounding communities are able to access these jobs, and that these jobs are paying fair wages and benefits, regardless of the role. And we need to make sure that uh, all workers are protected. Within the tech sector, we see large disparities emerging between headquarters, warehouse, and contracted workers. So in partnership with Silicon Valley Rising, we created this standard that tech companies should implement for contract workers, which includes creating space for workers to have a voice, providing career mobility opportunities, good wages and benefits, and making sure that the workplace is safe and ensuring that there's fair scheduling. Uh, we need to expand and equip the workforce. So training as a standalone approach is not going to lead us out of inequality, and it's not going to guarantee employment for most displaced workers. In order to solve this crisis, we must undertake multiple strategies, massive job programs, higher labor standards and protections for all jobs, innovative recruitment and development of new and diverse talent. At the same time, the tech industry has an imperative to make its employee base more representative of the population at large, and not just to create broader economic opportunity, but because companies with diverse representation at all levels are more likely to be successful uh, than those that aren't. And last, we need to make sure that everyone's basic needs are met. We need a new social contract that's ensuring that everyone has the basics to survive, and we must strengthen our social safety net so that no one falls through the cracks. So once again, there's tons of ways for you to get involved. We host uh, tons of educational events. We have one next week on uh, renting to own um, and one in two weeks about gig workers. And I'll talk a little bit about more uh, about those events later. If you're interested in public policy, um, I'll be talking a little bit about some of our priority legislation for the year and what happened with that. And as we get prepared for the next year, um, you know, you can reach out to me and uh, I can fill you in a little bit more about what we'll be working on. And for corporate practice, we offer a, a wide range of services to companies and provide ways for them to get involved in these issues from employee engagement to policy advising. So you can reply to the follow-up email if you're interested in that, and we can connect you with the right person on our team. So this is how we work. We try to make it as accessible and as easy as possible to plug in, um, but while building community in the process. So this year, uh, our key initiatives really uh, began with the Contract Worker Disparity Project. It's a first of its kind worker-centered initiative that sheds light on the practice of contracting out and proposes and advocates for public policy solutions and partners with companies to adopt some of these uh, responsible contracting practices. Next, we have the Tech Bias in Housing Initiative, which examines the promises and perils of housing technology aiming to ensure that technological innovations in the housing space do not reinforce the racist housing systems and policies of the past. Passing economic justice policy, so every year we introduce a bold policy agenda to address economic inequality in the housing market and in the workplace, and our priorities this year were focused around housing data transparency, equitable labor standards, affordable housing, data surveillance protections, and more. And finally, we have the System Reset Initiative, which is helping tech companies create on-ramps for people returning from incarceration. We're partnering with justice-involved people and organizations to get System Reset into every tech company in California. So what can you do today? You can do three things right after you get off this call. You can tell a friend about our work. 
You can sign up for a community conversation, which is really just a one-on-one -on -one meeting with myself. Um, we can talk about uh, your journey here at Tech Equity, what you're interested in, what you want to get more involved with, or if you have any general questions. Or you can take action with us by becoming um, a volunteer on some of our party legislation. So I'll talk about uh, one that we worked on this year. Uh, that's the Pay Transparency for Pay Equity Act, or SB 1162, Senate Bill SB 1162, uh, which would make pay equity reports public so that all workers have this information that they need to ensure that there is equal pay for equal work. And it ensures that companies create a fair and equal playing field for all workers by posting salaries in the job description and posting promotional opportunities for their existing employees before selecting a candidate. So for this, uh, we had volunteers call in to committee meetings to voice their statements of support, uh, sign online petitions in a variety of different ways uh, all throughout the year. And um, this was signed by Governor Gavin Newsom a couple of weeks ago. So the bill actually became into law and it'll uh, become law next year. And so the two events we have coming up, um, the first one is Rent to Own the American Dream, a panel discussion, which is next Thursday, 12 to 1 p.m. And we'll be talking about Rent to Own as an alternative path to home ownership, how it works, who stands to benefit, and what it means for the future of home ownership in the United States. And next we have uh, Gig Workers Across the Country, which will be in two weeks, also on a Thursday from 12 to 1 p.m., and we'll learn from workers, advocates, and researchers about the future of gig work and what lessons the tech industry can take from the long battle with uh, for workers' rights. So those are two events that we have coming up in November. We host a lot of events throughout the year. Um, I'll send a link to both of these on our events page uh, afterwards. So as I mentioned, you can do three things right after you get off this call. You can tell a friend about our work, sign up for a community conversation, or uh, sign up to become a volunteer on one of our projects. So I'm sure that was quite a bit of information. So now I'll take uh, about a minute to see if anybody has any questions. Uh, totally fine if if you don't. As I mentioned, we'll be sending out a follow-up email uh, with more information, a link to the recording, a link to the slides. And yeah, I'm not seeing any questions, which is totally fine. Uh, I want to thank everyone for your time. You know, we hope you feel inspired to join this growing movement. Um, you know, hope to see you either for our community conversation, an event, or uh, just have you volunteer with us. You know, please reach out if if you do have additional questions afterwards, or if you just want to talk, I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank you all.